In this tutorial, we will use LangGraph with state. The state is a shared data structure and represents the current snapshot of the app. The schema of the state will be the input to all nodes and edges, and all nodes in the graph can update the state. Using state, you can pass data from the first node to the last one, not only to the next node as we did in our previous tutorial. So let's dive in to see how we can use state in LangGraph. The easiest way to follow along with this tutorial is to use the corresponding collab for this video in our school community. Depending on when you watch this video, our community can be free or paid. So if you are interested in AI, automation, and finance, join the community today, while it is still free. After joining the community, navigate to the Classroom tab and then to the LangGraph course. Before watching this video, I recommend watching the LangGraph Simple Graph and LangGraph Conditional Edges first. Click on the LangGraph State link and open the cola. You need a Gmail account to be able to run the shared Colab. The advantage of using Colab is that you do not have to create a Python environment and can start running the cells immediately. Let's make some room and start with importing the required packages. When you try to run a shared Colab, you get a warning showing the email of the author of the Colab. We created a dedicated Gmail account for all of our collabs with the address business24ai.collab at gmail.com. If you see this email address, you can click Run Anyway. First, we install the required Python packages. This takes a little while. After installing the packages, we import them and make sure the LangGraph package is loaded. Next, we need to create our folder structure. As you can see in the folder section, there is only a predefined sample data folder. So we need to create a source folder and an underscore completed subfolder. Next, we define the path to our global variable CFG source folder. To create test files, we define a function and call the function with our source folder and the number of files we wanted to create. In our case, we wanted to create two test files, but feel free to change the parameter to create more or less files. To see the newly created files, we need to refresh the folder view. And sure enough, there are two new test files created in the source folder. The next step is to define the state. The state schema can be either a type dict or a pydentic model. In this example, we use a typed dict, and in the coming videos, we will explore the possibilities with pydentic and reducer functions. Here, our state has three values. The workflow steps is used to check how many nodes we traveled. In coming videos, we will use this value to safeguard against infinite loops. Infinite loops may occur when AI agents start thanking each other indefinitely. This situation can happen when you work with other frameworks where you cannot control the flow. The next variable is the source folder. This information is useful for check new files and process new files nodes. And finally, new files, which is a list of file paths. New files will list only the files in the source folder. Directories and their content will be ignored. In our case, underscore completed will be ignored. The next function is a helper function and is used to print the current snapshot of values of the state. Now it's time to define the functions representing the nodes in our graph. The first function is called function init. Every function in our graph takes the state as input and returns back the state. So the function init takes the state as input and overrides the workflow steps while it returns the state back. This happens because we use the unpacking operator in Python and then override one of the unpacked values. To understand this better, we can imagine the unpacked version of state 
and know that if we have a variable name after the unpack operator with the same name of one of the unpacked variables, it will override it. So the unpacked variable workflow steps will be overwritten. The advantage of using this method is it doesn't matter how many variables the state has, only the workflow steps will be overwritten and the rest will stay untouched. The next function is the check new files function. Again, it takes the state as input and overrides the new files list while returning the state. In the function, we first add one step to our workflow steps. So we update the state directly in the function. Then we get the source folder from the state and print it. Next, we define an empty list and iterate through the entries of the source folder and join the entries with the source folder to get the full path of the entry. If it's a file, we add it to the list. And if it's a directory, we completely ignore the directory and its content. After the iteration is done, the files list will include all of the files in our source folder. Then we override the new files value of the state with our files list when we return the state. Again, to have a better understanding, we will imagine the state is unpacked. So the value of new files will be overwritten. The next function is a routing function and will be used in our conditional edges. In this case, it can only return two values, wait or process. So it acts like an if-else statement in our flow. This function takes the state as input and adds one to the workflow steps and checks how many entries are there in the new files list. If the new files list is empty and the file count is zero, then there is no files to process and we go to the wait route. Otherwise, there are some files in the source folder and will be processed and we go to the process route. The next function is a simple function. It is our watchdog wait function. It adds one to the workflow steps and waits 10 seconds. So if you need to wait for one minute, you can change it to 60 seconds. The next function is process new files. It takes state as input and adds one to the workflow steps. Then it takes the source folder from the state and creates a path for the source folder. The target path is the subfolder underscore completed in the source folder. In the next line, we create a unique prefix so that every file has a unique name in the target folder. Even if we run our flow multiple times and there are files with the same name in the source folder. Just to be sure, we create the target path if it does not exist. Now we are ready to iterate through the entries of the source path. If we find a file, we rename and move it to the target folder and add one to the count processed. After the iteration is done, we return the state and reset the files list. The last function is a very simple function. It doesn't do much, except of printing some logs and add one to the workflow step. Now that we define all of the functions representing our nodes of the graph, it's time to create our graph. This time we use the state graph instead of just graph and provide the state and assign it to workflow. Now we can add nodes and edges and conditional edges to the workflow. It is a good practice to start with a node and do some initialization in the node, like any other programming language where you first initialize your variables. In this way, you have a clean start. It is also a good practice to finish the graph with a node for cleanup and maybe log some information in the database before ending the execution. In our case, we use the function in it to initialize our state and add the node in it to our graph. As you can see, the name of the node doesn't have to match with the function name. 
Like here, we use init as the node name and the corresponding function is called function init. Next, we define an edge between the init node and the check new files node. We add three nodes to our graph where the node name and the function name are the same. Check new files, watchdog wait, and process new files. Now we want to implement our conditional edges. As you can see, we are coming from check new files and have a routing function called router is new file. In our case, this function can only return two values, process and wait. In case it returns process, the flows goes down to the process route to the process new files node. And in case of wait, the flow goes to the wait path and to the watchdog wait node. We already added the nodes and their corresponding functions to the graph. So the routing function acts like an if else statement for the flow control. When we connect the watchdog wait node, to the check new files node, we create a loop and we have a cyclic graph. Here is where LangGraph shines. So the flow continuously cycles in the loop till the condition changes and we go down to the process path to the process new files node. We add a final node, a log results to our graph where the process new files is directly connected to it with an edge. Our graph needs an entry point, which is the init node, and needs a finish point, which is in our case, the log results. When all of this setup is done, we compile the graph and assign it to our app, which is now ready to run. Now it's time to run the app. We create an initial state, and as it is an instance of the type dict, we provide all of the values and pass the initial state as input to the app. As we define the entry point of our graph to be the init node, this initial state will be passed to the function init as input. Before running the last cell, we see we have source folder with the underscore completed subfolder and two test files. Keep in mind that the underscore completed subfolder will be ignored. We run the graph and the function in it will be called with the state as input. And when this function returns the state, it will assign one to workflow steps. So when we print the values of the state with the helper function, we see workflow step one in the output. Then it goes to the next node, check new files. The check new files function prints the count of files and lists them in the new files list. As there are files in the source folder, we go to the process route and process new files is called. This function renames the files and moves them to the underscore completed subfolder and clears the new files list. Finally, the log results prints the workflow steps. When we refresh the files view, we see the files are renamed and moved to the subfolder. Now the source folder contains no more files and we can run our graph again to test the second route. So we create the initial state again and run the app. This time when check new files is executed, there are no files in the source folder and the new files list is empty. So our router function returns wait and we go to the wait path to the watchdog wait function and loop the cycle till we go again to the check new files node. Now we add a file to our source folder. After adding the file, the router function returns process and we go to the process route to the process new files node. This time, only one file is renamed and moved to the underscore completed subfolder along with the two files from the last run. To wrap it up, we see that we can use state in our graph to transfer information between each node of our graph, and each node can update the state. 
If you need more information about land graph and the state concept, you can go to the land graph documentation and from there navigate to the conceptual guides. And from there you can scroll down to see information about the state and other conceptual information. Good luck using state in your land graph.